Today, we are discovering what secrets Survivor Winners at War did not tell us in the edited television show. What is great is how the official DVD and Blu-ray releases of each season of Survivor contain some secrets that are game related, some that are personal thoughts, and some that are just plain silly. And we will even find out the truth about why some of the winners weren't on this season and how originally this season wasn't even supposed to be all winners in the first place. Basically, as long as it isn't part of the show that aired on television, it is fair game to be considered a secret. While most of the secrets here are focused on season 40, Winners at War, some of them do apply to Survivor as a whole. So with that, I want to thank you for watching what I make and ultimately supporting what I do here with liking, commenting, and sharing. For only a few bucks a month on Patreon, you can pick what videos I make, watch all this channel's content early, chat with other fans of the show, and even get exclusive videos every month. Thank you for your support. Heads up, this list contains the secrets that I personally found to be the most interesting. They're not every single secret that has to do with the season, just the ones that I liked the most. So with that, let's count all 54 of them in absolutely no particular order. Number one, when planning for season 40, all winners was not on the table. Jeff had said as far back as season 31 that there simply just weren't enough winners who wanted to do this and would just say yes to the season in general. So what kind of season was Jeff pitching before they decided on doing all winners? I was pitching a very different idea, still an all-star type season. Mm -hmm but it wasn't this. It wasn't nearly as good as this. Number two, since they did decide on all winners and they only cast 20 out of a pool of 38 potential choices, why were some of the winners not chosen to be on this season? Let's go through these one by one and keep in mind, I am only mentioning the ones that I have a source for when it comes to their information. And I will put those sources in the video description below. The most notable absent winner from this season is Richard Hatch, of course, winner of season one, and the reason he isn't on the season is a bit unique, as back in season eight All-Stars, he was involved in an incident with Sue Hawk that had him being naked in a challenge, and they basically made contact, which had Sue break down and quit the game. Due to that and the Dan incident that happened pretty late in Island of the Idols, Survivor did not want to put someone with that kind of controversy on their all winter season. So while he was originally invited and cleared to play, they ended up pulling him when the Dan incident happened on 39. And let me tell you, if you watch Richard Hatch's YouTube channel, he isn't happy about this at all. Number three, I don't have any solid info for Tina Wesson from the Australian Outback. It is rumored she was invited and cut, which is a shame if true. But this next winner was one I really wanted to see back, and that is Vesepia Towery. Being the first winner of color, you would think Survivor would at least give her a courtesy call just to see if she's interested. But no, she didn't hear one single word from them. Do they have any contact with you on this? Zero, none, milch. Not even a, a text, not even an email, not even a, a phone call to say, hey, we thought about you, but we already cast it. Thank you. No, nothing. Number four. I think this one feels way more self-explanatory considering the controversies and rumors surrounding him. But Brian Heideck was not invited back. And on Johnny Fairplay's podcast, he claims to not care at all, but he is such a natural liar that who knows if this is even the truth. Number five, I don't have anything regarding Jenna Marasco or Chris Dortry as much as I would like to see him play again, but for Tom Westman from Palau, he was considered, but the way that Jeff Probst explains how he considered Tom sounds a lot like that Tom didn't make their top 20 and they wanted to do some sort of parallel seasons idea, but that just seemed way too complex. Number six, Aris, who at least got to return for season 27, was invited back, but decided ultimately to not participate to stay with his family. Number seven, Earl Cole was invited to play too, and his return would have been greatly welcomed by the fan base like Yule. Yule is now beloved more so than before, but Earl declined to play due to his wife undergoing premature labor. However, he does say that if given the opportunity to play again, he would do it if his schedule lines up with survivors. Number eight, Todd was considered and didn't make the cut, but his was not as serious a consideration as someone like Richard Hatch, since all he ended up receiving was an email just gauging interest and that's it, which is still more than someone like Vesepia got. Number nine, we have all awaited the day that Challenge Beast, nerdy teacher, oldest winner of all time, 
Bob Crowley would be asked back to return, but according to him on Twitter, they didn't say a word. Number 10. I have no solid information on JT Thomas, Natalie White, or Fabio, which is a shame in regards to the last two people I just mentioned, since neither of them have played a second time. But there is one winner who was asked, was guaranteed a spot, and simply said, nah, I'm good. Of all the people we wanted, I would say Cochran is the only one that would have been on the list that if he had said yes, would probably have a spot on the show. Number 11. Once again, I don't have any solid information on Mike Holloway, but believe it or not, Chris Underwood was asked back after his very controversial win in season 38, but they called him 12 hours into his honeymoon and he put his marriage above Survivor, which ultimately is the smarter move just for life. Number 12, this next secret has almost absolutely nothing to do with Winners at War, but stick with me here because it is strange. During the preseason press for Winners at War, which Jeff does a ton of, he was asked about the weirdest thing someone has done in an attempt to get on the show and prepare to feel mm, a little creeped out. I was flying to Salt Lake for some event and there was a guy next to me on the plane the entire time and we get to Salt Lake, and just as we're getting off of the plane, we've had the entire flight, he goes, listen, I have to confess something. Um, I flew here just to talk to you, and I had a friend at the airline who put me in the seat next to you. And I'm walking off the plane going, wait a second, you got, you were able to be seated next to me? That's creepy as all <laughs> get out. And I said, you waited three hours, and now you're talking to me as we're walking off? And he goes, I know. I was kind of nervous. I said, yeah, it's not going to work well on Survivor. I don't think this is going to be right for you. And I said, what are you going to do? He goes, I'm on the next flight back home. Number 13. Remember when I said earlier how Jeff thought all winners could never happen because of enough of them not saying yes? Well, here's him explaining this. For years, certain players like Amber, Boston Rob, Parvati, Yule, Ethan, they'd all said, no, I don't want to play again. I was sitting in the office at CBS with the president of the network who said, I really want to do winners. Yeah. And he's obviously the president. I said, I just don't think we're going to have a very good group. And he said, why? And I said, because they, they've all said no. And he goes, well, you could ask. Like when I'd called Rob, we had already asked him to be in our 39th season, right. Island of the Idols. We had no idea we were going to call Rob for 40. And I called and said, hey, believe it or not, I'm not calling you about 39. I'm calling you about 40. I know the answer is no, <laughs> but I have to ask. And he goes, you know what, bro? I'm thinking about it. He's thinking about it. <laughs> well, while you're thinking about it, yeah. do you think Amber would want to do it? No, she wouldn't because of the kids. Right, right, right. But I'm going to talk to her and I think she will. But I want to point out how Jeff says that basically the ball didn't get rolling until Boston Rob agreed on a phone call where he also roped in Amber to join, which is very interesting because Sandra says during season 39 that Jeff came up to her and Rob and asked them, hey, would you guys be interested in all winter season? And uh, Rob says no and Sandra says yes. So did Rob sit on it and change his mind in the week and a half between the two seasons? Would they have really thrown together an all winter season in that time? No, they wouldn't have. So someone's story here is false and I don't think it's Sandra's. When I got invited to do 40, I was already on Island of the Idol season yeah. 39. And it wasn't until halfway through that Jeff said to me, would you consider ever playing? And Boston Rob said no right off the bat. And I was like, Jeff, sign me up. Number 14, it has been commonly joked about in the Survivor community that Boston Rob winning season 22 isn't worth as much, isn't seen as high, isn't seen as good of a win as other players since he was a four-time veteran playing against a bunch of one-time rookies. And those rookies didn't even seem that great in the first place. But I always wondered if Boston Rob felt the same. Here's Sandro with the inside scoop. You know, it's like, it's fascinating to hear him say, hey, I've played four times and this is how I messed up each and every time. And then finally on season 22, Redemption Island, where he finally won, you know, he played his heart out, but also he didn't get credit like I guess he wanted because it was like he, they put him with all these little kids. Mm. You know, it was like taking candy from a baby. Number 15. As I mentioned earlier, Jeff did a lot of preseason press for season 40. The most I have seen him do in a long, long time. So finally, someone asked him about Survivor ever going to a cold climate for one season. And he says, Will we ever see a season of Survivor in a cold climate? Has it even been discussed? It has been discussed. 
couple of issues. One is just gear functioning. And two, when you just start imagining it, what are people going to do? It's not that we need to see people in bikinis. It's not that yeah. simple. But what are they going to do when it's super cold? What are you going to do? You're going to try to stay warm. You're just going to huddle. Yeah, and I think it just kind of works against the idea mm -hmm. of society and watching the behavior of a society. But right. if we get to season 50, cut to Antarctica. <laughs> I think this question's hilarious. Forget the cold climate. Survivor won't even leave Fiji anymore. They're way too comfortable. Number 16. What are Jeff Probst's top three favorite moments in all of Survivor history. If you guessed when him and Boston Rob drove a truck in All-Stars, when Boston Rob won season 22, and when John Cochran won season 26, you're probably right. But that's not what Jeff admits out loud, of course. The very first minutes of the first day of the first season, I'll never forget it because it was a live event. We, we rehearsed what we thought was going to happen, but then we all got together and we said, okay, we have 16 people. We don't know what they're going to do. And then in the all-star season in 2004, Rob proposed to Amber live at Madison Square Garden. And I was standing there as he was doing it, watching the audience cheering, wanting them to be in love. The third time was the opening minutes of this season because it was, it hit me weirdly in an emotional way when these 20 people walk up on the sand spit and what I saw was my own 20 years of life. I remember Amber wow. being a young woman in the year 2000 in Australia, and now she's a mother with four kids. And I remember all of these different people. And so I saw my own life sort of, oh, I was single here. I started to mature <laughs> there. I met my amazing wife there, and now we have kids. It was, for me, the same yeah. thing. Number 17. Most of us heard the rumors about the players on season 40 being given some guaranteed money to play. An appearance fee, if you will. Tony basically confirms this in his interview with Rob Sesternino, and it sounds like it is the main reason he said yes to playing. So then they called again, and I was like, you know what? Right now, I don't think is the time. And then they called back, and they said, okay, we sweetened the pot. You know, we're going to give everybody across the board X amount of dollars. And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's worth it. Maybe I'll go out there and get some pool money so I can put a pool in my house. So that's why I was talking to my wife, and I said, you know what? If I go out there, even if I last two, three days, maybe I'll get enough money with the X amount of dollars they've given us, I could put a pool in my house. And that's why I said, let's do it. Number 18, the return of Ethan Zahn this season was much appreciated. We hadn't seen him since season eight. And since season eight, he went through multiple bouts of cancer that of course he survived. And sometime in there, he made a brief appearance on The Amazing Race. But did Survivor ever ask him to return prior to Winners at War, but after All-Stars? They've asked me before, uh, 2016 they asked, uh, but it, I would have gotten back the night before my wedding so yeah. my wife really want me to really go for that one because if I miss the flight I miss the wedding and so I kind of had a pass on that one and I don't think I was ready like mentally I don't think I was ready what yet would that have been Game Changers? Uh, 2006 summer of 2016 yeah I think Game Changers yeah number 19 Danny's exit on Soleil seemed pretty cut and dry she wasn't in any solid alliance and she outed the old schoolers to the new schoolers seemingly in a way that made her look really bad but what we didn't see on the show was how Jeremy actually falsified a story about Danny looking through his bag to make her look bad and of course it worked to so jeremy's bag somebody, anyway, he said somebody went through it. Sure, he's like someone's going through my bag to probably throw deflect off of him because he thought he was next in line and it, it ended up kind of circling around and people talking about and it ended up blaming danny for it which caused a whole big thing um and uh i think it was an un unfortunate situation for danny great move on jeremy and people bought into it. People supported him and had to take sides. They actually didn't show any of that on the show, but it was, in my mind, important. And so when it wasn't on the show, I was like, oh my God, they didn't talk about the bag. It was like a whole day. Number 20. We all know Jeff has a man crush on Boss and Rob. Let's not play around here. These two are just meant to be. But with Sandra also being picked for Island of the Idols and getting considerable respect from Jeff, as we will later discuss in more depth later on in this video, who would Jeff choose as his favorite rob or sandra oh god that's brutal uh um rob oh sandra i hope you're not watching i know this. i love sandra she be, she's won twice i know but you're asking me i love how he pretends this is a hard decision when we all knew the answer 15 plus years ago number 21 but now the real question comes up who is jeff's favorite winner of all time is it cochran boston rob tony nope 
as it turns out. Favorite winner of all time. I'm going to say Ben, and here's why. Because there was something about Ben's season and him being a war hero and having to fight from the bottom to stay in the game and the entire reason he was out there, other than earning money for his family, was to say to other vets, look, look, I went through it too and I'm okay. I love that Ben is, is on some level really a pure guy saying, it's been hell to come back for more. And look at me, I'm on Survivor, I'm living, I'm actually having fun and I won. So don't give up. Number 22. Now we all saw season 40 and saw how the players would get in the voting booth and like look around for an idol or an advantage or just anything really. This escalated so much that at one point Adam tried to use a piece of Jeff's podium as an idol, which by the way, he got that idea from Survivor South Africa. He didn't just make it up, but maybe just maybe the American Survivor players are not as crazy as they seem. As Jeff explains during this tribal council tour. But the idea this season was to make it more private. So here no one can see you so that in theory, there could be a twist. There could be something waiting for somebody. Something could happen that nobody would know about that would be changing the game in real time. Mm -hmm. And they'd walk back down as though nothing happens. And that's what we're starting to look to do more is yeah. things that happen in here and in here but when you go down, nobody knows who did it. Number 23, the poker alliance became a hot button issue in the pre-merge when Yule did a seemingly big brain play to bring up the fact that it exists as if any of us knew about it and uses it as a way to put the target on others. It made Yule look amazing for doing some extensive research, but who knew that it was actually some super fan who told him about this alliance before the game began. So I think the poker alliance thing, I didn't know if it was a real thing or not. I mean, I thought it certainly could be. It seemed entirely possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, there was that kind of statement that Tyson had made, uh, which by the way, I, I cannot claim credit for that. I mean, I, I was sent that by a, a super fan who I'd gotten connected to, who yes. was basically trying to like, help me out, right? Number 24, remember when we basically had Tony confirm that there was money given to the players to simply play on season 40? Well, Tyson devised a game plan in the preseason to take advantage of this and get the target on some of the others. So one thing I think that's gonna actually come into play a lot is uh, pregame stuff. Not even that people have been strategizing pregame, but the lies that you can craft mm -hmm. with pregame knowledge. Before the game, Aris called me, he's a former winner. He's good friends with Parvati and John Fincher who are married. Right. John Fincher called him, said that Parv only agreed to come out if she got paid the same amount as Rob and Sandra got paid for season 39, which was 200K. All three of them gone. Number 25, in a secret scene from episode one, it is clear as day that Ethan is just loving life. In fact, we see this on the actual show as well, as he's just having a good time until he gets booted way too early. But in this bonus scene, he shows everyone a very special skill he has that I am not sure how a human being can do. Like, I don't get how anyone does this. Last night, I realized that the rice is so good. I can swallow <laughs> it, and then I can regurgitate it, and then swallow it again. Now, when do you want the rice back in my mouth? Oh, okay. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Hey, anybody oh looking for God. the idol? The Nathan's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Number 26. Okay, okay, so Ethan can regurgitate food. Big deal. It's gross, but not very helpful for his game. What would be helpful for his game is if he could lie, because he basically never did this in seasons three or eight, but in Winners at War, it would be hard to reach the end without the skill. So he has Parvati teach him the ways. And then if Danny comes to you, the plan is Danny. Right. Do I tell her that? Ethan, do not do that. I'm not the greatest liar in the world, so I've learned. And so, like, Parvati and I needed to role play a little bit. I don't want to put you in a tough spot right now, but Tommy, are you voting for me tonight? Uh, bit, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it went all right. The first time didn't go so well, and the second time we got through it. Oh, try again, Ethan. <laughs> Number 27. Later on, when all the old schoolers' games are in the tubes and they are on the edge of extinction, Food is a scarcity, and just the thought of it really gets them going, and the thought that they could use fire tokens by peanut butter has them meditating in a whole new way. She delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> yum. 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 Really? Yeah. Yum. <laughs>
Number 28. Despite how much the loved ones visit ate up screen time, somehow they still didn't show us everything. Go figure. When Kim and her husband talk, we get some more on-island proof that even through this part of the post-merge, people still saw Tony in a different light. Tony's energy is like through the roof. He's hysterical. Is he still playing that same? No, he's played a completely different game. Number 29. This secret scene comes from the finale, and believe it or not, everyone is dead, tired, who would have thunk? But what is crazy is seeing Tony still working non-stop, which includes chopping large branches, idle hunting, and doing cartwheels on the beach. I asked, hey guys, what is your energy level? Everybody said zero, zero, two. They asked me what's mine, I said oh, about a seven, but I'm like a 15 right now, you know? So Tony's so amped up all the time. He's running around camp. And never in Survivor did I ever think I was gonna play with anybody crazier than myself. I feel like a succubus. I'm sucking the energy out of them and I'm getting stronger. I love it. <laughs> a succubus. <laughs> Number 30. Speaking of Tony's hard work, we saw on the show how he played off that he was bad at making fire, but then he beat Sarah at the final four doing just that. So how did he get so good without anyone seeing him? I was building fires throughout the jungle since day one. I would build the fire. See, because at nighttime, I would be the, the, the fire tender. I would just tend to the fire. I would just keep, you know, and I would be making my own kits, my fire kits. I would steal some of the kindlings that we gathered all day. I would steal some of the husk and I would put it in a basket. And I would take that basket, and when everybody's sleeping, I would run so fast down the beach, climb into the woods, and build my own fires, you know? Yeah. And then I would run back to camp, like maybe once every two hours, I would run back to camp, and I would stoke the fire, I would put more wood in there, I would purposely bump into people, step on them by accident, they would look at me, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just tending the fire. So just in case they wake up later, they know that I'm tending the fire. So I'm probably just getting some wood to, you know. So I was just doing crazy things right from the beginning. Number 31, Tony made a lot of subtle moves to be a different player this season. To be fair, all players are making subtle moves all the time. It's just stuff that the show doesn't have time to show us. They would have to dedicate every minute of every episode to one player like Tony, and now we wouldn't have time for anyone else. For example, Tony handled tribal councils much differently than he did in Kagayan. Tribal councils, I never looked at Jeff. Jeff knows how to play the game. He knows what you're looking for. So in Kagayan, I would be like looking in his eyes. I'd be looking for him. Everywhere his eyes went, I was there because I wanted to speak. I wanted to say something in tribal. This time, every, way he, every time he looked at me, I looked down, I looked away. I did not want him to talk to me because I needed to be quiet and say as least as possible in the tribals. I did, want, I did not want to look like the old Kageyan Tony talking in tribals with trickery and this and that, I, flashiness. I didn't want none of that. Number 32. Did you know Tony built another spy bunker this season just like the one in Game Changers? It's true. But when he eventually built the far superior spy nest, production didn't know he was up there and didn't get any footage of him being sneaky sneaky. So he told them about it and here's what they finally did. So I would just nonchalantly walk there and just climb up my tree and just chill without the production knowing. So the next day when I had a conversation with them, they rigged the whole tree with GoPros. Yeah. There was GoPros. And yeah, they, they had it all set up. Every branch I was stepping at, a GoPro would break, you know, black tape that they wrapped the GoPro on. Number 33. There is a secret scene that has to call hiking up a hill at their camp, though not everyone finishes the journey. When the few finally make that hike all the way, you can see, from their point of view, a production boat, the edge of extinction, and seeing this view makes me wonder something. Is it possible that this hike and this view was the inspiration for season 41's Summit Island, where they do pretty much the same thing, but as part of the game? It was the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. I mean, getting to see Fiji from up there, it's insane. You can see islands and you can see three different colors of water. I mean, it's just amazing. Number 34, after losing that final challenge to get back into the game, Jeff talks to everyone who lost and has them say something that essentially puts a bow on their game and their story in a sense. When he talks to Kim, he presents her as the best at doing this and she's like, what are you talking about, Jeff? In real life, I said, I am. And he goes, let me that right back to you. And then I want you just to go into it. Don't say I am. <laughs> that, was, that was such a weird thing to say to somebody. You're so good at wrapping up your story. How I often do you no do idea. that? But Rob, it's been really great talking to you tonight. And I just want to say I appreciate it. No, I'm not. I'm not good at that. <laughs> Jeff doesn't know me. Number 35. This next secret is short, but sweet. And pretty ironic if you consider how Jeremy was with Stephen Fishback in season 31. Because Ethan apparently reminds Jeremy too much of Stephen Fishback, and uh, he didn't like that. You know, Jeremy said I was jittery. You were jittery. <laughs> 
that was jittery. One of the, he's like, you remind me of Fishbox. Is what oh, he said. Oh, yeah. He's like, you're all jittery. He, he, he thought I was paranoid. Like, I wasn't, you know, so I think that had an impact on him. Yeah. He said, I was paying too much attention to Rob. So it was one of the reasons he wanted to vote me off. So I think Jeremy just wanted, you know, his whole thing was meat shield, right? Mm-hmm. So I was in the way of his meat shield, and I don't think I was a big enough character to be considered a meat shield. Number 36. Sophie on the jury was clearly not caring at all, but that was mostly due to sickness. In this interview with Rob Sesternino, she explains why that was. Uh, I am fine. Uh, I did not feel okay at the time. Uh, I think in the end, I mean, what the doctor, his perspective out there, which I think was right, was that so a lot of the crew had gotten ill at the same time. I think about 40 of them had gotten the virus. And I honestly think I just got the same virus, but my body was not in a place where it could fight it off in 24 hours like everybody Mm -hmm. else did. So I basically had like 102 fever and was throwing up for about five days. Number 37. Remember in episode one of David vs. Goliath when Nick said, I didn't come here to work, I came here to play Survivor kind of echoing the sentiment of Russell Hans before him. Well, it almost got him kicked off that season, so you would think that when he came back to play again, he would not repeat this mistake in Winners at War, but nope. Like, I felt like with Nick, I I went out of my way to protect him. They didn't show this on the show. There are a number of things that happened where people were targeting Nick. A a lot of the reasons, actually, uh, that we did target specific people was in part to kind of protect him and other folks. Mm -hmm. But I also felt like he wasn't really helping because he would not do things around camp. (laughs) It just made him such an obvious target. would be perceived as not really helping out and just you know and i said this like he just consumes everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously i kind of exaggerated in that situation but um yeah. but he did eat a lot number 38 if given the choice would jeff start doing every season with two tribes or with three historical evidence says two and heck winners at war even starts with two tribes kind of the proof i'm talking about but jeff says he actually prefers three tribes two tribes or three tribes if i had to choose then three tribes because anytime you can the more you can slice it and dice it and complicate it, there's always one, at least one person who makes a move and they go, oh, I I might like this tribe better. Number 39, after getting eliminated from the game and losing the last challenge, Wendell arrives at Ponderosa. Now for the uninitiated on Wendell's winning season, Ghost Island, Chris Noble was the first to Ponderosa where he did this, uh, well, you could call it a rap, I guess. And let's listen to part of it before continuing. Giving a dream on Ponderosa. Swung for the fences, I call it Sammy Sosa. Yep, that's very real. So anyways, it's ironic since Wendell told Chris in that season to stop rapping. He's not good at it. But when Wendell arrives at Ponderosa, he sings. Living my dream on Ponderosa. Swung for the fences, I call it Sammy Sosa. Number 40. In the season, there was a humor storyline about how Nick would always butt into conversations uninvited. Seemingly, we would see people and then off camera would in come Nick and he'd be like, oh, hey guys, what's up? He would come in completely unannounced and it was just funny. Well, at Ponderosa, not much has changed. Congratulations. Congratulations. Four beautiful, strong women. Hell yeah. And Nick. Oh. Thanks, guys. And Nick. <laughs> Fan of all Girl power. Number 41. Kim tried to make a connection with Sophie in the game and failed. Sophie had no idea why Kim even gave her half of the idol that she found, and the two never seemingly clicked. That is until Ponderosa, where they declared their friendship. And even a year later on a podcast, Kim said, hey, that's still going strong. Yeah, I mean, emotions run high at Ponderosa. Yes. But yes, I think Sophie and I oh. will be friends for life. Yeah. Uh, we talk, not a ton. Sophie's an introvert. Yeah. Sometimes I call her and she doesn't answer. So if you know that's true. Same. But then she randomly FaceTimes me every time I'm like at a birthday party or somewhere that I shouldn't actually be FaceTiming. Sophie mm-hmm. FaceTimes me and I take it. So yes, we're good. She's teaching me how to bake scones. Number 42. Maybe you already knew this, but I had no idea. There are three tiers of Survivor players. Tier one is the best. Tier two is pretty good, and tier three is, uh, well, we could say it's average, I guess. Let me just have Wendell explain this to you. There are three levels of survivor players. There's a a first tier, a level one. That is your Boston Rock, Sandra, Kim Spradlin, Jeremy No, I'm a two. Then there's a level two. Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Where am I? Wendell (laughs) Howe. Dama Bate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dude, then there's your level three. Gym. That's your Ben Dreamer. <laughs> your 
Tyson a boss. Tyson a boss. <laughs> Number 43. Who knew Parvati and Danny could be a dynamic duo of comedy? I had no idea. And if you had asked me this preseason, I would have said, I, what are you talking about? I say this though, because they both poke fun at Tyson with how he acts on and off camera. This is Tyson. When the camera's on okay. him, people are looking at him. <laughs> Number 44, when Denise arrives at Ponderosa, the fun and games stop. Not because she is stopping them, but because the people who were on the edge of extinction that are now at Ponderosa are not at all too happy with her and there's a discussion about moves and who gets credit for them. Nick asks, who blindsided Sophie to which Tony's name is thrown out and Nick doesn't like this. Who blindsided Sophie? <laughs> Tony did? Well, I voted with him. I voted you, I wrote your name down, Sophie. Me and Tony are both, man, why, why don't we get credit? And no, his question is never answered, so we don't know the result of that conversation. Number 45, who knew that after all the shenanigans we saw of Tony's ladder in the show proper, that there was even more shenanigans happening with it to get even more food? Jeremy says the fire department would not approve of this. Tony's ladder was hilarious. It's so unsafe, it's so ridiculous. First of all, that climbing angle was way off. It was nowhere near safe. It was not fire department class A specific. It would not pass any codes. It would be put out of service immediately. Number 46, why did Sandra quit the Edge of Extinction and not at least be on the jury? Well, she explains that she had no idea that had she just stayed, she would have been on the jury. She says, had anyone told her that was gonna happen, she would have probably stayed, though she's not guaranteeing anything. She was under the assumption that after that first Edge challenge that everyone else who lost would join her on the pre-jury trip to Australia. I guess she never got the chance to watch season 38, though she was stuck on season 39 when it was airing, so kind of makes sense. And I think had I known that I was going to be part of the jury, I think I would have stuck it out. I'm, I can't say for certain that I would have, that that would have changed my mind. I had never been part of the jury, and I think that if anything would have stopped me from leaving the edge of extinction was that bit of information if I had had it, you know? But in my mind, I was like, oh, they're gonna do one challenge and then before you know it, they'll be right behind me. Like, you know, I ended up going to Australia and spending some time there. Number 47, after a special screening of episode one of Winners at War, Dalton Ross hosts a special panel and he asked Boston Rob why he didn't tell Sandra he was going to be on season 40. And here is Rob's explanation. I come from the old school mentality that the game starts when Jeff says go. So there's a little bit of this notion of pre-game alliance that feels dirty to me. I don't like it. I understand that people do it now and it's part of the game and the game's evolved. But this contradicts Sandra saying that Tyson said in the actual game how he was tasked with protecting Amber. But why would Tyson think that he's tasked with protecting Amber since he wasn't on the same tribe with Rob? So the only way he would have been told this is in the pregame if Rob talked to him. Number 48, those massive statues from Island of the Idols, you better believe the players on season 40 saw them before the game ever began. And people like Wendell were like, yeah, this is amazing. I love that these statues exist because it puts an even bigger target on Rob and Sandra. And of course, Amber as an added bonus. If they didn't have a big enough target on their backs, you know, just going in and knowing, coming in with the understanding or, you know, you hear rumblings that it's probably going to be an all winter season. Seeing these wonderful, beautiful statues uh, solidified that. And I think it was good to see. Number 49, when people win a million dollars, they purchase and do nice things, such as Parvati buying a brand new car or Sandra going on a cruise. But what about Wendell? What fancy thing did he spend his $1 million on? I splurged on a Rihanna shower curtain after winning the money. So I think it was maybe like 60, what, what are y'all laughing at? <laughs> Number 50, after Rob and Sandra got statues in season 39, many people started wondering if Survivor had a Mount Rushmore, who would be the four faces of it? I would love to know what your guys' answer is to this. Just comment below with the four names. But when Jeff is asked this question, he answers, I need two heroes. I'll pick Ben. I, uh, I gotta go Parvati. 
That's a parody. Um, that's not really two heroes. It's basically three villains and a hero. Number 51. When Jeff is asked what his favorite season is, the answer is of course going to be incredibly biased. He's being asked this right before season 40 airs. So if he said Cambodia was his favorite, he wouldn't be doing his job correctly. It's kind of the wrong question at the wrong time. Though I would love to hear what Jeff in the current day answers with his least favorite season and why that is. Uh, your favorite season ever? This one. 40? Yeah. And I've never- I've it's in a promo thing. No, uh-uh. This is this is the best season we've ever done. Number 52. After all these seasons of hosting, what shocked Jeff the most? What happened in the first 40 seasons of the show that just had him blown away and wondering, holy crap, I can't believe that happened. Well, as it turns out, we had a really hot day, an unusually hot day, and we were in the dirt and we had these giant sand pits and they were big. They were probably like, you know, half of this stage and deep and we had hidden one flag, I think, somewhere straight down and this one tribe just couldn't find it. And they're all digging and they're all digging. Just as the challenge was ending, they both dropped. And it was this really dramatic moment. And then the other guy was just out, completely out. And he was out for about 20 minutes and I was holding his head. And you know when they put that oxygen mask on and you always see the person go <laughs> They put it on and nothing happened. And I remember thinking, well, that's such a lie on the movies when they show you that. <laughs> and then after almost 20 minutes, he went and his whole face got big again. Like he was dying. And then later our doctor said, you know, you were panicking for the helicopter. He was not ready to travel. He wasn't, he wasn't gonna make it. And then everything's fine. And he actually came back and, and played again. But that was the scariest moment. Number 53, have you seen MTV's The Challenge? Well, it's a show mainly focused on competitions, but they have asked many Survivor players to be on it, such as Tommy Sheehan, Jay Starrett, and even Natalie Anderson. I just won my first elimination on The Challenge. You know, Angry Natalie is the best competition, Natalie. I was so fired up going in. Number 54, but that's not all. The Challenge also asked Michelle for Gerald to play too. I would love to know what winners you guys want to see compete on the show. If it were up to me, let's just get them all on there. I am the ultimate secret agent because people think that I'm this innocent girl, but I am a wolf in sheep's clothing. So which secret blew your mind the most? Comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.